Hello and welcome to this week's Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. This week's guest is not only a successful artist and painter, she's a scientist at heart, a bronze sculptor and accomplished helicopter pilot. Hannah Shergold was a veterinary student at Cambridge University, became a sculptor and eventually served as a British Army captain, flying the twin-engine Lynx on the front line in places like Afghanistan. Hannah has become one of the UK's most successful self-represented artists, known for her extraordinary wildlife pieces, and believes passionately in the power of art to do good. Her work has raised more than £300,000 for conservation charities like Born Free, the World Wildlife Fund and Tusk, and also the UK Invictus Games team. Hannah is an ambassador for Tusk, and you may have seen her stunning life-size painted gorilla in London this month, along with 14 others, painted by people like Ronnie Wood from The Stones, photographers David Yarrow and Rankin, and actor and comedian John Cleese. The pieces have raised £130,000 to help critically endangered African gorillas. By her own admission, Hannah has a fascinating yet peculiar backstory, one we'll unravel on this episode. And Hannah's joining me now from a studio in Cheltenham. Hannah, it is great to see you again. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. You're just back from the annual Tusk Awards, which Prince William attended. Uh, How was it? It was absolutely inspiring. It's the most wonderful event to celebrate the Tusk Award winners and just hearing their stories and seeing what they do on the ground. That's what makes it all worth it. It was a real privilege to go. And as I mentioned in the introduction, you painted one of the gorillas for auction for Tusk. And I know that you've done that before as well. What was your inspiration for this year's artwork? And perhaps you can describe it a little bit to us. Yes, I went with the idea of a tattooed gorilla. And I just liked the idea of playing really with the idea of how close gorillas are to humans and we see the most wonderful tattoo art on humans, but what would that look like if gorillas were tattooed? And what would they choose? What would they put on their bodies? So I had a lot of fun with it. There was a lot of messaging in it about endangered species and the messaging of going, going, gone. There were quotes from Diane Fossey in there, but also there were my own little jokes to myself. He had bees tattooed on his knees because he is the bee's knees. And I just enjoyed playing with it. It was one that I think really resonated with people and when they could read it. So it got a great reaction and it ended up raising £10,000 for Tusk last week. So I was really happy with that. That's wonderful. How do you set about doing a piece like that? Do you draw it all out or do you have it all in your head or does it just change and evolve? And, And how long does it take? Because it was quite... I don't know, extravagance, probably the wrong word, but the detail in it was extraordinary. It was all hand painted. And so it does take time to physically create it. But in terms of the ideas, it was really about searching for meaningful quotes and messages and images that could be painted on particular parts of the body. So a big portrait on his back, because that was the biggest space really. And then really just taking inspiration from human tattoos actually, and and where they're placed on the body, but then really making people think when they read it. But in terms of how long it took, most of my projects, they expand to fill the time And so I I set myself a deliberate deadline of just over a week. I put in some quite long hours during that time to get it done. So it's quite an effort. And do you have any idea of following the auction where your gorilla's home will be? Is it in somebody's garden? or I mean, you need quite a bit of space um, to display something like that. Funnily enough, the, the wonderful couple who bought mine were brand new to Tusk. They called in on the morning and suggested that they might like to bid and were then invited to the actual event. And so they came in the evening. They had no idea about mine, but liked it enough that that was the one they ended up buying. I'm so pleased that they've joined in the momentum for, for raising money for Tusk. And I hope that we continue a relationship and they continue to resonate with the art that's coming out because it all donates a percentage to Tusk. And you're always in such good company on the Gorilla Trail. I saw you photographed with your fellow ambassador, Ronnie Wood, who's been a supporter, well, since the beginning for 30 years. I've been lucky enough to interview him. He's great fun, isn't he? And also a wonderful artist. 
Yes, he is brilliant and very, very down to earth. What's not usually known about Ronnie Wood is he's actually a classically trained artist. And is so, he? yes, there was a wonderful documentary about him on Amazon and it really explored the idea of that life choice between does he do art and does he do music? And fortunately for us, he went down the, the music line. But he's a very accomplished artist. He and his wife Sally are just brilliant and it was fantastic that they both came to the auction as well, because that definitely means that his the piece will raise more money on the night. And I think his topped 35 or 36,000 pounds. So yeah, it's Tusk's very, very lucky to have them both. Oh, well, they're also very lucky to have you. And I've known you for a couple of years now. And we've talked about doing a podcast and probably my fault that we haven't, I haven't actually pinned you down to do it. And your story is fascinating, Hannah. I don't know all of it, but I'd love to unravel a little bit of that story. And I wondered if, first of all, you can just give me the overview because there are not many guests that I can cap gen artist, sculptor, helicopter pilot, etc. But you've had quite an extraordinary life so far doing a variety of things. So how would you describe it as an overview, first of all? Most of it came about through a, a very, I suppose, juvenile version of what I want to be when I grow up. And I wanted to be a vet, but it was based on my nine-year-old brownie animal lover's badge I want to work with animals, what will pay well, vet, done. And so that was my focus for the next several years. I think I put the blinkers on and I knew what GCSEs I needed to do, AS levels, A levels, which universities I needed to apply for. I didn't bother going to careers fairs because I knew I wanted to be a vet. And I sort of landed in Cambridge and I found it fascinating but after a couple of years, I just realised that I wasn't as enthused by the career that was ahead of me as everybody else was. And so much as I was really enjoying it, I knew that it wasn't worth going beyond my first degree at three years and continuing on to the clinical aspects of it. So I made the decision at that point to change. And much to my parents' dismay, I said, yes, I want to give up being a vet and I want to be an artist and I want to be a sculptor and many eye rolls. But I pursued that and I created a little business out of it and I was producing bronze sculptures of people's horses and dogs, the majority of which was commission. Created a lovely little business from it, but it ran into the 2008 credit crunch and it just didn't survive. So I got to the end of 2008 and I needed a job. So at that point, I could either take my university degree and go into the city. And in hindsight, there was no work in the city for a, essentially I was a graduate. Or I could go and do something that was really exciting and I wouldn't necessarily be able to do later on because I would have missed the age threshold. And that was to go and join Sandhurst. And I went in probably slightly naively. I thought it would be really good fun. And, and it was, I found it fun and funny and very, very hard physically and mentally. But once I was in there, I was able to sort of really look at what job do I want, really think carefully about what that job would mean. And I opted to go for the pilot stream. And it's a very long commitment, but I was ready to do it. It was definitely the thing that floated my boat. And it was very challenging mentally, scientifically. You had to have a lot of knowledge of physics and met and the principles of flight and all that sort of thing, but also a lot of coordination and spatial awareness. And they put you through your paces in the aptitude tests, but I passed it all and passed the medical, which that's really completely out of your hands. And I commissioned into the Air Corps. Eight years after that, total nine years in the army. And that saw me doing a complete variety of different jobs within flying. I had a ground tour initially with the infantry in Afghanistan and then began my flying training. And I was on the Lynx. Once I'd qualified, I was on the Lynx. And that was a brilliant aircraft to fly. It is incredibly capable, extremely agile, and it's really multi-role. So we would do everything from strapping a 50 caliber machine gun on the side of it and a camera 
and playing on the ranges in Kenya and Canada, right through to medical evacuations. And we were taking real-time casualties in Kenya who had everything from snake bites, spider bites, heat stroke, gunshot wounds, right through to those who had been trampled by elephants. And that was one of my last flights actually, was the guy who had not fared well in a tussle between a mother elephant and himself. He didn't come off very well from that. He survived it, but he decided to try and challenge this mother elephant. And and at the last safe moment, decided that his best option was to hang on to her trunk <gasps> for dear oh, life. Oh no. Oh I my mean, goodness. it's funny in hindsight because he survived. He had a very serious injury to his arm. And so we had to go and collect him in the dead of night, dust landing, very, very tricky flying, but you have to do it. And I loved that aspect of flying when it was really physically and mentally challenging, dangerous, but dangerous within limits that were calculated. And I found that an incredibly rewarding job. And do you miss that kind of flying now, Hannah? Because I'm imagining that's something probably you can only do for a certain length of time if you also want to have you know, another life too. I get asked this question all the time, do I miss flying? And the honest answer is no. I found it brilliant. I loved the really challenging bits of flying like that. But the reality is it's not all like that. As an officer, probably my most important role was not actually the flying. It was my role within the squadron Towards the end of my career, I was an ops officer, I was a second in command of the squadron. And so the people management or logistics management or kit and equipment management was actually more important than me being a pilot for the squadron. I ended up fighting for about 15 hours a month. So I loved the bits of flying that were those really punchy, challenging bits, but it wasn't all like that. By the time I finished, I was ready to finish. It was a choice to finish rather than that choice being taken away from me. So, And what a contrast for you sculpting in bronze to then going out to, I would imagine, some remote deserts and pretty austere locations and being part of the military. Yes, very much so. But I think by the time I ended up going to Afghanistan, I, I actually went to Afghanistan very shortly after commissioning from Sandhurst. I was an, attached to a unit, an infantry unit, that I didn't know they were already out there when I flew out there and I had no pre-deployment training. You couldn't do that these days. It would break all sorts of rules. But back then, that's just what we did. So I was just this complete, what we in the military would call a crow. I knew nothing. I was a one-pit wonder. I was so junior. Of course, I had spent a year as a cadet and then I had had no time in regiment to establish myself as an officer. So every time someone saluted, I'd be looking around for the officer. I didn't, <laughs> I hadn't clocked yet that they were saluting me. And so it was just so surreal, especially to almost more surreal now to look back on it than it was even at the time. And so I was down there, I, I was in Afghanistan in the summer of 2010. It was a very busy operational time for that unit, an incredible experience. And I learned an awful lot from being down there. Was I in absolute frontline danger? No, I wasn't qualified to be. I can understand how people come back from tours like that and find it very difficult to process because I was sort of on the periphery of it. I was still down at a forward operating base at a FOB, but even from my position, just the constant influx of casualties and death there was very challenging actually. And I can only imagine what it would like for people who were even closer to it than I was. So a fantastic experience in all its good and bad aspects. On my notes here, I'd, I'd written down to ask, what do you feel you learned about yourself during that time? Because I would imagine it's a steep learning curve and perhaps a very interesting time for reflection when you're doing work like that. Very much so. And in hindsight, it was just all happening so fast that I was only out there in the end for two months and I was then flown straight back and I had about two days before I 
then started on my pilot's course. So everything was just happening so quickly, but with a level of excitement about the next bit and the next bit and the next bit, which almost means you don't really concentrate on what has just happened. But I wrote a blog whilst I was out there and actually reading the blog, I'd almost forgotten that in that blog, I wrote quite a lot about what was happening and and the impact on not just me, but those people around me in the unit that were losing their guys. And I had forgotten that I'd written it. So I find the the mind a very fascinating beast that it can do the coping mechanisms for you without you really realising what's happening. At some point you've got to, you know, that may be 10, 15 years later, at some point it is always worth just like you're doing with me now, you know, what impact did that have? Just having a look at it and seeing what what did that impact later on in my career, in my life as a whole? How does that impact what I do now? I don't have all the answers to those questions. I think probably the biggest thing I learned about myself was that I didn't know anything. I didn't have really any life experience, particularly in comparison to those guys that had been on three, four tours already by that stage. Not only were they in a tricky situation, but they'd done it before and they were going back. And that's a real interesting thing to get your head around that bad as it is, people will put themselves back in it. But I knew nothing. I really had no idea what I was going out to see. One thing I did recognise was that what we had been taught in Sandhurst, I, I sort of hadn't clocked how important it was whilst I was doing it, but suddenly you see it all being pieced together whilst you're out there. And suddenly it all makes sense. That was brilliant actually to know that, oh, that's why they were teaching us this. And, you know, that is what an orders group looks like. And that is what a rehearsal drill looks like. And to see it all happening, it wasn't just to make our lives difficult. That I enjoyed, but straight into the next thing. And there was a level of excitement about coming back and starting flying training. There was a lot to do. We were straight into more medicals, into things like the dunker training where you're basically put in a metal box and put underwater and turned upside down and forced to hold your breath until you can escape. And it's... Oh my goodness. I would, I would hate that. And when you were out there on your missions, is that where you had time ever for a sketch pad and to draw? Did art play any role in that time, Hannah? Or were you too busy, she says, trying to find how that all linked back to the beautiful work you do now? Well, in Afghanistan, I did a lot of photography just with my little point and shoot camera. I made sure I had a very good one when I was out there. But the drawing came about when I was posted to Kenya for six months and that was doing the the medical evacuations. The thing about the medevac is that you spend a lot of time waiting for something to happen. So we would be forward based and the exercise would be going on around us, but you might not do anything for a day or two. And then seemingly everyone decided to get injured all at the same time and it would be very, very busy. But everyone has a hobby. Some people will read, some will spend more time in the gym, others will play PlayStation. But my hobby was sitting down with a sketchbook. I loved doing pen and ink drawings and watercolours and they were very portable, very clean methods of just getting something on paper. And I had no intention of selling them, really even showing them to anybody. But I had made a lot of friends in the expat community out in Kenya. And when we got back from the end of the exercise and we were, we were based in Nanuki, somebody saw my sketchbook and they owned a little restaurant and said, will offer you an exhibition. So I marketed it. And the deal was that I had to do the preview night on the day that they had their buffet. So it brought more people in for them. And I had an audience for a preview. So it was a week long show. And I I sold 10 or 11 pieces just for, you know, three, 400 pounds each. And I had done self-employment as an artist and it had failed. And I was absolutely adamant at that point, never again, it's too unstable, too risky, and I will keep this very much as a hobby. And I came back from Kenya, but carried on doing what I had been doing out there and they kept selling. 
And then the demand increased, the pieces grew in size. I moved over to oil paints and they continued to rise in in value because the demand was high. And I knew I wanted to leave the army at that point because my aircraft was going out of service. I didn't really want to transfer over to anything else. And I had about 18 months left to either figure out something else to do or really develop this art idea into something that was going to hit the ground running. And that's what I did. So basically for my last 18 months or so, I had two jobs. I did my army job and I built this business into something that could support me when I no longer had a salary. Not only does it support you, Hannah, you've made some wonderful contributions for charity, which we'll come on to in a minute. But for those who haven't seen your paintings, I'm probably thinking of the large oil paintings that I've been lucky enough to see. How would you describe your style and what you do? And then in a second, I'd love to hear about the process as well. It is very contemporary, alternative. It is on a sound subject matter of animals. There's some portraiture in there, but mostly African wildlife, horses, and a little bit of portraiture on the side. In terms of style, I love to experiment. And so my style is deliberately loose. That is due to the fact that I used to overwork everything and I didn't like my own style when I used to overwork it. I found it very boring, but I couldn't help myself from overworking these pieces again and again in pursuit of perfection. So the style has come about because I actually took a builder's scraping tool to the painting and went to destroy it and scraped the paint through itself. And I was painting with palette knives, so the very thick impasto paint that was just sort of laid onto the canvas. And I just scraped it all off. And what came out of that happy accident was this way in which the paint had blended through itself, but also these slightly geometric horizontal and vertical lines across the canvas. And it was sort of, oh, hang on a minute, there's something in this because there was a randomness to it, which I was trying to create, but had no method or knowledge of how to do it. And suddenly this accident had found it. And so the whole style has developed from there. So I basically have, I suppose, anatomically correct images but they are broken up with geometric lines and layers, which add a level of interest to the painting, which I couldn't create manually. And I think if people want to get more of a sense of that, then they should look you up on YouTube because you've done some fantastic short time-lapse films. I like the fact they're about a minute long Mm. and they give a real insight into you at work and the different stages. And sometimes you see the piece and you think, oh, she's finished. Then as you say, you do something to it that almost to a layman looks like you're destroying a bit and then something else evolves. It's, I've never seen, I've been around a few painters in my time and, and my childhood actually, a great friend of my dad's Chinese artist and painted the longest painting in the world of Koi Ka. Oh, wow. And I remember him painting, my auntie had a lovely old house and he painted it in oils in the garden with me as a nine-year-old under the tree. And That painting hangs on our dining room wall up in Grimsby. So it was fantastic. And he paints with knives. He's in his late 80s now, but he paints with knives. So it's fantastic to see that. Those time-lapse films, did you do them because it was difficult to describe to people asking about your process? Not so much. I did it because I self-represent as an artist. So therefore, I don't have a gallery doing my own marketing I was very aware that from the beginning that I was going to have to put a lot of effort into raising awareness about my work and growing my audience and doing that myself. Social media was something that did not exist when I was doing sculpture. So sculpture would have been 2006 to 2009. Facebook was in its infancy. Instagram was a twinkle in the eye of whoever invented it. So you couldn't broadcast to an audience back then that you didn't know. You had to either have that audience already or you had to buy it. But suddenly Facebook and Instagram, and we're going back five, six years now, Twitter was a lot bigger then. These were the platforms that you would be able to share your work via. And my whole business grew from me sharing a piece on Facebook and saying that it was for sale. And 
initially my buyers were people in my own network of friends and family, and then people that were friends of friends. And then it developed into people that I didn't know at all, uh, but it has all grown from sharing it on social media. Now that the value of the work is so high, it's not necessarily the same audience that I have grown from Facebook. I find that I have my own mailing list and I have subscribers, but also I have a lot of contacts through LinkedIn. That's a really big audience for me. But one thing that knits them all together is that if I show people a picture, they won't stop scrolling. If I show them a video, they'll stop and they will watch the video. So I suppose I recognized quite early on that sharing the process, I had a lot of people saying, why are you showing people how you're doing it? They'll just copy you. And I just wanted to say, I can't copy me. Because I was going to say, good accident. luck with that. <laughs> yeah. And I can't copy it because it's all an accident. Yes. In theory, you could take a piece and you could copy it exactly, but I drip a lot of paint. I will paint one layer of it and then I will spray thinners at it and watch all the paint basically melt off of the canvas. But much as that breakdown of the painting is devastating at the time, and it looks, as you say, like you've just completely trashed it, it adds a layer of interest into that layer that you cannot recreate manually. And so all these drip marks and the way that that particular drip has gone through that colour and then that colour, and it's gone over some gold leaf and then off the gold leaf, and it's dragged that colour through the gold leaf. And I love the sort of serendipity of it. It's almost like someone else is helping me paint it and bringing in that level of chance that I don't have the confidence to do myself. So the spray, the thinner sprayer, that's my assistant, the one that's sort of saying, <laughs> just go for it, just go for it, spray more, spray more. And, and then you think, oh no, what have I done? And sometimes these mistakes are catastrophic and I will try something and I think, well, that's the end of that one and that's going in the bin. But my whole process is based on not being so precious about the work that you are afraid to experiment. So you have to be prepared that every piece, worst case, is going to go in the bin. But if that is the worst case, well, it's not that bad. No, exactly. It's not going to kill you. You've lost some time. And sometimes it's disappointing that your painting went through something that was really good and now it's nothing. But that's the worst that's going to happen. But what you gain from it is something new that you wouldn't have got had you not taken a deep breath and sprayed it with thinners. And I suppose you could apply that to most of life as well. If you don't try stuff, you will never know what chance encounters might come out of your just, like I say, taking a deep breath and just taking the plunge sometimes. I was very late in life, Hannah, at seeing wildlife in the wild. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we were on the same trip to Lewa, I think it was two years ago in mm -hmm. Kenya. That's the first time that I've seen a lion or elephant or giraffe. And I think that I'm an Africa file at heart even though I'd never been and I I think everybody is oh my I goodness. think everybody it, it, feels this funny very weird sense of going home yeah when you that's go a good to way Africa. of describing it and I haven't explored an awful lot of Africa I spent a lot of time in Kenya and I've spent time in Rwanda because I went to see the gorillas and in my entire life that's been the best thing I've ever done and I can't recommend it highly enough but I understand what you mean about this feeling of going home. Now, some people will have this idea that we're all at heart from Africa. I don't know. I, th I think each person will have their own view about where that comes from, but there's something about it that's just phenomenal. It's magical, isn't it? When you see animals in the way that they're mm. supposed to be seen, there's a real majesty, a beauty going out as the, the sun rises. But I was just wondering whether your beautiful paintings of lions and cheetahs and, and gorillas, do you use any photographic references? References, Hannah, or, or all these images in your mind? I definitely use photographic images. And the reason for that is that if I'm going to play around with every aspect of the painting, colour, shape, um, the geometric lines that are going to go through it, add in some gold leaf, if I'm going to muck about with all of that, the one thing that has to hold true is the anatomy. Otherwise, the whole painting falls apart. So I study the anatomy of it. And my veterinary background helps quite a lot with that, actually. But I use photographic imagery to guide the composition. And I will stitch together compositions from multiple photographs in order to get 
the idea of movement in the paintings. So I might have a zebra, for example, that is leaping across the canvas, and that will be compiled of three or four different images of a zebra, but I will stitch them together and create this new form. But usually my photographic source material is all black and white. And of course, as you've seen, my paintings are in full colour and very unnatural colours. But the idea is that it doesn't matter what the colours are. All that matters is whether it's a light colour or a dark colour in that particular place. So I can then add whatever colours I want because I'm just looking at the black and white version of that image. Do you ever pinch yourself, Hannah? Because it sounds like you have so much fun with your art. And I'm sure... Like any profession, I'm sure there are stresses and strains, etc. And you know, you're your own, you run your own business. But it sounds a wonderful thing to do for a living because it brings together the scientist in you, the veterinary studies, your love of art, your love of animals, your love of Africa. Do you ever stop and think, gosh, your peculiar journey has got you to somewhere that I think feels very special? I love what I do, but the reason I love it so much is because it isn't just about the painting. And one thing I know about myself is I am a deadlines person and I find it very difficult to just paint. I need to paint for something. And this is the first year since I left the army that I haven't done a big London show in the summer. And I've actually found it very difficult to motivate myself. And that sounds very, very self-indulgent, but I, once I'm on a project that produces my best work, I don't know why, but there's something about the urgency, dare I say it, panic to sit down and challenge yourself that you will paint an entire collection in the space of three and a half, four months. Because what I do is I set those deadlines in very short time. So I will announce a show in the January of a year that's going to be in June and I'll broadcast it across social media. I'll announce it to the press. Last January, I said to Tusk, right, I, th- I think I can raise you £100,000 this year. And then when they all come back and say, great, can we see a sample of what's in the new collection? I'm like, no, because I haven't painted it yet. <laughs> and so the next six months is very much head down. And I sort of allocate the time that three and a half, four months to paint it. But alongside that is actually setting up the show doing all of the bookings, liaising with galleries, booking the preview, which last year was give or take 250 guests. So I plonked the show straight on the mall and As you do. very much go big or go home. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, no pressure, but it's a very expensive thing to underwrite. And so it has to work. And it's almost like you don't have an option for it to not work or for you to say, oh no, I'm just not in the mood to produce my best work at the moment. No, I've got to produce my best work. There's, there isn't an option to come up with second best, but I have a real sick like for that kind of pressure. I think it gets the best out of me. I do identify with that. Having spent 25 plus, it's more than that, but I'm sticking at 25 plus years in in live broadcasting. Mm. There's nothing like the adrenaline of live broadcasting. And I like a deadline. I like to, yes. I like to have a deadline. And I, well, I think I probably did my best work live. I shouldn't probably say that on the podcast, but, but there was, you just had to do it. You had to prep and do it. And yeah. there wasn't a chance to redo. So I, I identify with that. And I think there must be some psychology behind this that I haven't looked enough into yet about procrastination and putting things off until the last safe moment. I did not write my speech that I was going to say in front of all of these guests until the day. And I had it on my list of things I needed to get done from like three months out was write this speech. But something in my brain says, nah, you don't need to do that now. You could leave it another day or yeah, just leave it another day or another week. You can do that next week. And then when it gets to the point of if you do not write it now, i.e. in the three hours you've got between, you know, when people start coming in the door, then it's going to be embarrassing. And so I wrote it and then I went and stood in a room in the back of the gallery, walked around trying to memorize it. And I was terrified, but it worked. And I don't think it would have been any better had I planned it earlier. And you're getting interested in psychology, aren't you? Very much so. I find it fascinating and it's more to do with 
how, well, everything really from how people think, what encourages people to make certain decisions, even things related to sleep and why we sleep, what the benefits of sleep and the impacts of not getting enough sleep, that really ticks the boxes of my sciencey veterinary background. And it's a really fascinating subject. So it's something I've read quite a lot about over the last year, certainly. Oh, it's fascinating. I'm, I sit outside with my takeout coffee, getting 20 minutes of sunshine or daylight, which apparently helps with my circadian rhythm. So definitely <laughs> learning definitely. all about sleep patterns and find all that fascinating. Art is your love and safe space. And you say that in a beautiful quote on your website, but it says you are by trade a scientist. Just expound on that a little bit, Hannah. I think everything about the way I approach my art is sciencey. Again, I'm looking at the psychology of this and starting to question that actually. Because I come from a sciencey background and that's what I've always been good at, I don't necessarily have the confidence to say that my art is good in its own right. And so I think I lean on the sciencey background a lot in my mind to carry me through. And I'm just starting to almost accept the fact that the art is good in its own right. The art is arty. The art doesn't need to be sciencey. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that I self-represent. I don't necessarily, much as I, you know, my work has been commercially very successful, it doesn't necessarily have the endorsement from the art world because I'm not represented. It's not necessarily that I haven't wanted to be represented. It's not that I have wanted to self-represent. It's neither. But I get a bit of imposter syndrome within the art world. And so I think my coping mechanism for that is to say, but it doesn't need to be arty. I can apply the science to it, make it work as a business, and therefore it will justify itself in that side of things. But actually, no, it is good. People are recognising it for what it is. And I think that's taking a little bit more confidence to accept that and and come to terms with that. But the science has always carried me through because it's yeah. logic, because it has patterns. I like that. But I suppose what ends up falling out of my brain when I start creating pieces is much more on the artistic side. And that's slightly unusual to me but I'm starting to accept it, I suppose. No, it's great. And to explore how, how we're all wired as well. Mm. A lot of people have one career in their life or one talent or one passion or one thing they pursue. Mm. And yours is such a mix, but talking to you, I can see how it all weaves together, but it's fascinating. But I, one thing I will say is that if you look at it from the other side, in that most, most arty, art, I will call them arty artists, what I mean by that is people that have set out into becoming an artist purely through the usual channels, they most of the time do not want to do the businessy, sciencey bit. Not only do they not want to do it, but they can't do it. They're just not wired that way and they don't want to. So I suppose that has been what has distinguished it is that because I've approached it more from the not just science, but I suppose army side. The army has taught me a lot of skills that I didn't have in my sculpture business. Management skills, event management, budgeting, planning, project management. I didn't have those skills before I joined the army. And so I have used those to build a business whose product just happens to be my own art. And most people won't have that background of skills to, to lean on in order to fashion a business that will sell their own art. And as well as the business though, Hannah, you've given an awful lot back. It'll probably embarrass you, but I said the the figure in the intro, I mean, it's more than £300,000 that your mm. art has raised for some amazing causes. It's really important to you, isn't it, that the art does good? Very much so. I think there might, again, we're delving into the psychology here, there might be an element in there that I don't feel that it cannot give back that it the only way that I can justify its value going up is that it does good because I don't deserve to just keep it all. And I, I believe that. I don't believe that we should go through life without keeping one eye on how we can give back. So I have given back a lot and even at times when I couldn't afford it and not really, I had to make it work 
But at one point it was very much, no, I'm not giving up on my commitment to task, even if that means I can't afford my mortgage. I don't quite know where that comes from, but I believe in honouring commitments and I had committed to it and that was what I was going to do. It gives me a real sense of satisfaction that the art not only does, as the business grows, the charities that I support continue to benefit even more. So it bec- what it becomes is a circular idea of the more the art grows, the more I can give to the charity, the more the charity shares the art, the more the art grows and it keeps growing together. And so I think Tusk has really recognised that we can grow it together and it will continue to do even better things as the profile of the artwork rises. And just before I ask the final question, Hannah, you talked a little bit about portraiture and of course you did an amazing piece featuring Sir David Attenborough, which seems to sit so well with the rest of your work. Just tell me a little bit about that because I've watched the the time lapse of you creating those. It was like almost a triple image of him, wasn't it? That was a really interesting little project that I was attempting to put together. Everybody on the planet should want to meet David Attenborough, Sir David Attenborough. And if you don't, I frankly, I think there's something wrong with you. But (laughs) I really wanted to paint him and I wanted to paint him live. And I put together a pitch where I've created these two studies and this falls back to my sort of businessy approach to it. I found a corporate sponsor that would sponsor a project. I found a venue, Blenheim Palace, that would exhibit it. And I found a very high profile newspaper that would want to put it into their very high profile luxury magazine to cover the project. And so I put all this together and I put it in a pitch and presented it to Task. And they in turn, what the idea was, was I would paint him live and the piece would be auctioned and 100% of whatever it raised would be divided between Task and Flora and Fauna International. So the project went off, it went via Tusk and then to FFI and they came back and they said, oh, really sorry, but he's only just accepted a commission to be painted for the David Attenborough Centre in Cambridge and he doesn't like this attention and we're not going to ask him again. So the idea was a good one, but the timing was off. But yes, that was my idea was to present it in such a way that it would do really good things if we were able to do that project together. But it wasn't meant to be. So I still have my two David Attenborough portraits, one of which has already raised 14,000 for Tusk, but has been kindly donated back to sell again. What a lovely story. And just finally, Hannah, as you know, we've been asking everybody what the biggest risk they've ever taken is. I would imagine you're probably spoilt for choice because I think there's probably a few risks there in in the story that you've told today. But what would you say your biggest risk was or is? I think the obvious choice, which isn't going to be my answer, would be the choice to leave the army and take up art. It was very risky, but ultimately... The business was tiny at the time and I had a lot of scope to just do something different or, you know, just go and work in Starbucks if I couldn't make the mortgage. I think the biggest risk now and the biggest risk overall is growing it to a point independently where it continues to rely on its future success. That's a very nerve wracking position for me to be in. There's no reason to suggest it won't continue to grow and be successful, but that has been a very big risk to form the business in this way that is all on me. And I'm yet to see if that big risk will continue to flourish and continue to make the business flourish. I think it's a good one. I'm really glad that I took it, but that is by far the biggest risk is growing it to a stage where it has to continue to be as big as it is now. Gosh, what a great answer. Having seen your artwork in person, I'm confident that you will grow and you'll flourish. You're so talented, Hannah, and your work is beautiful. It does some great things. And I think you've given me a real insight today into your work, into who you are and and the pressures that you face. It's very easy to look in and imagine you you know, in almost a sweet shop full of colours and painting, but there's a lot to it. I'm looking forward to seeing you again and catching up with you. And it's been such a treat. Thank you so much. Thank you ever so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. 
You're very welcome. You have been listening to the wonderfully talented Hannah Shergold talking about her art, time in the army as a helicopter pilot, the scientist within, and her passion for psychology. Download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week with another inspirational guest. Join me then. Thank you.